Okay, I think we should start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those joining us today on this webinar. This webinar comes to you, as you see, from the Hull Deformity course. Um, joining me as a co-host today is Professor Heyman Sharma, who's also the Principal Director of the Hull Deformity course, and we'll be looking after our question and answer session and the discussion uh, as it goes along with the webinar this afternoon. I think we have a great uh, webinar today. We'll be looking at the deformity of planning and analysis and case management tips and tricks of foot and ankle deformities, uh, which is very topical. Um, and I hope you're going to enjoy that and also some complex cases that we have for discussion. We have two great faculty members today joining us um, who are also faculty members of the deformity course. We have Professor Gamal Hosni from Cairo in Egypt and uh, Mr. Om Nahoti from King's College London, both whom probably require little introduction as they have a very extensive uh, limb reconstruction and deformity practice and many years of experience. And so we are looking forward to hearing from them. Today's webinar is going to have uh, three sessions. Three sections. First of all, is looking at the deformity analysis and planning by Professor Hosni. We're then going to look at some tips and tricks to help you along the way from Om Lahoti and then some cases and some discussion and question and answers afterwards. So please remember to use your Q&A button if you want to, raise some questions, discussion points, and we we'll hope to get to as many as we can through today's meeting. So I'd like to invite Professor Hosni, if you'd like to start off uh, with your talk, looking at the deformity planning and analysis of foot and ankle problems. Thanks, Kamal. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Gavin, Sharma, and Om Lahoti for including me in this session. Um, I'm going to speak about the principles of ankle and deformity correction. Uh, just I want to remind everybody that we start today uh, from 7 p.m. our International Cairo Deformity Conference. It's today from 7 p.m., tomorrow from 6 p.m., and Friday from 4 p.m. Till, till 12. And you can join us. We have about 27 international guest speakers uh, from all over the world, giving us their experience with the formatives. <clears throat> what we need to know, if you want to correct foot and ankle formatives, do we, the first, do we have to correct it? We have primary and secondary deformities. And if you think about foot and ankle deformities, you have to give it a, th a second thought. Do you have secondary deformities or not? Which deformities you've got? Do you have isolated foot and isolated ankle or both of them? And where is the exact apex of the deformity? And you no, know, you usually say that you have one cora, but in the foot. You have one core, or sometimes you have more than apex for the deformity. Let's see. This is the worst example you can give if you want to discuss something about the deformity of the foot, the kivus foot. Kivus foot is the worst. This is the most difficult deformity to deal with. And if you think about the deformity, you have to think about muscle imbalance and structural alterations. In the foot, you have to think about the muscle imbalance. Sometimes you have dynamic deformities. So the deformity, you can see the deformity while the patient is walking. But during rest, you can, you can see nothing. Also the deformity. Sometimes it's not just foot deformity. You have also this cloto deformity. And you have drop of the first metatarsals. So sometimes it's more complicated than you imagine. The apex of the deformities. Sometimes it's multiplanar deformity. So it's not just one apex. Because in plantar flexion, the lateral column may be different than the medial columns, right? It's, sometimes it tends to be more rotated. What are the angular 
ankle deformity. Simply, just in front of vein, you have varus deformity, as you see here, varus ankle, or valgus ankle. And the sagittal plane, you have equinus deformity or calcaneus deformity. But actually, it's not that simple. If you look to the foot and the ankle, you can have club foot, equinocavoverous deformity, so you have a deformity of the ankle, and you have deformities of the foot. Sometimes you have also deformities of the toes as well. And this is pis plano valgus, you see. You have a deformity of the ankle again, and you have a deformity of the foot, and you have a deformity of the toe. You see the big toe, hallux valgus. Also, it's pronated, as you see here. When you analyze the deformities of the foot and the ankle and you want to draw the axis, you have to draw the mid diaphysial line of the tibia, you see here. So see, this is the lateral X-ray. If you imagine, this is the lateral X-ray. <clears throat> and you draw central lines of the shaft, and this is the mid diaphysial line. Another line between the anterior and posterior lower ends of the tibia and you have anterior distal tibial angle, the anatomic anterior distal tibial angle, it's about 80 degrees. And the center of rotation is at the lateral process of the talus. This is the talus and this is the lateral process. And usually this mid diaphysial line passes through the lateral process of the talus. For the radiological assessment, you have too many lines to draw sometimes. It depends upon which lesion you've got. But you see, this is plain lateral X-ray. Usually we would do it standing X-ray and AP. And you have many lines and many angles if you want to. In lateral, you can draw the axis of the talus and the mid first metatarsal axis, as you see here. And the calcinian beach from this line to that line. So sometimes you need to draw many lines depending upon the type of lesion you're dealing with. In general, some people just do plain, uh, plain X-ray, AP and lateral, but this is not enough. You need again the long film. AP and lateral, because sometimes you have secondary deformities. And perhaps you have another deformity on the other side, which uh, you have to put it in mind before correction of the deformity. And this patient came to me with all polyomyelitis of the left side. And when you draw the, and you have the long standing x ray, and you have various deformity of the other side. You have to put it in mind before correcting the equino cavoverus of the left side. See, and you can see here this is the calcaneal. You see the calcaneus here and the talus, the verus position. You see in the standing X-ray. We start with the most common deformity, the equinus deformity. Plantar flexion deformity of the ankle is a very common deformity that can develop in many or several congenital and acquired conditions acquired in pediatric orthopedic patients. And you see in these diagrams, this is an equinus deformity you see here. But where is the apex of the deformity? The apex of the deformity lies in the distal tibia. Again, this is an equinus deformity but the lesion or the deformity lies in the joint itself. You see here. And another equinus deformity, and you have a four foot equinus. You see here the picture. You have a four foot equinus. And do we need to release the soft tissues here? So you have an equinus deformity, but you have to analyze where, where is the center? of the deformity. So what is the site of the deformity if you have an equinus? Distal tibia, 
hind foot or fore foot. As you see here, and you, if you draw the mid-diaphyseal axis and the axis of the distal tibia, the anterior distal tibia angle is 110. So this is the site of the, of the lesion. Again, an example, when you draw the mid-diaphyseal line and the distal line, or the joint orientation line, the angle, anterior distal tibial angle is 80. So we don't have a problem with the distal tibia. The problem is here. You have a flat top talus. Again, in this case, with equinus, perhaps the same degree of equinus. Again, the mid diaphyseal line and the joint orientation line, making anterior distal tibial angle of 80, which is quite normal. And we have a problem with the forefoot because you have cavers deformity. Do we have desirable equinus deformity? If you have a weak quadriceps, if you have uh, a mild equinus deformity, this will help the patient to walk normally. So it's perhaps you have a desirable deformity. And if you have a quadriceps, which is zero quadriceps, and you correct the equinus deformity, perhaps you are going to change the gait of the patient to our situation. And this is calcaneus deformity, which is usually seen in association with congenital postromedial bowing of the tibia. Again, how the gait or how the function of the patient accommodates with uh, the deformities of the ankle and the foot and the ankle deformity. Uh, this is an important equation because various and vulgar deformities are normally compensated by the ankle, by the subtalar joint. So if you have a normal subtalar, perhaps you have a compensatory movement. So the patient can walk nearly normally, in spite of having varus or valgus deformities. So one needs to differentiate between ankle valgus, hind foot valgus. It's imperative to impair, to obtain a standing AP radiograph of the ankle when evaluating the foot problems. So if you have a valgus or varus foot, you need again to have an ankle view. And this is standing view of the ankle to see the vulgus deformity. Again, if you have a vulgus ankle, you need to know, do you have a vulgus subtalar joint? Because sometimes you have both. If you have syringomyelocele, uh, many times you have an, a, a vulgus deformity of the ankle and foot, both. And if you wanna correct, you have to correct both deformities at the same time. So in this case, if you want to do AP of the foot, 30 degrees ankle equinus, 30, 30 cranially this, this tilted tube to see high talocalcanian angle. You see that talocalcanian angle, you have a high talocalcanian angle. So you have a vulgus foot. If you have a vulgus deformity of the hind foot, Perhaps it's purely ankle deformity, a subtalar deformity, or ankle and subtalar deformity. And you look here, this severe vulgus deformity of the ankle. So don't be optimistic. If you see a vulgus ankle and you just correct the vulgus ankle, because perhaps you have subtalar vulgus deformity, which need to be corrected. Again, take care of the fibular shortening. An abnormal shortening of the fibula can lead to a vulgus deformity of the ankle joint, which is a common finding in a paralytic ankle. You see here, this is shortening of the fibula. Yeah. The fibula should be about 11 millimeters below the medial malleus. So in many cases with paralytic problems or sometimes with fibular hemelia, 
you can do fibular lengthening to correct the valgus ankle deformity. You see the fibular length lengthening here to restore the normal ankle alignments. So you have to put in mind all these considerations. This is the long talk about the compensatory mechanisms. The ankle joint can compensate more recurvatum than procurvatum. And the recurvatum of the distal tibia is better tolerated than procurvatum. Why? Because the normal, the normal subtalar range of motion is 30 degrees inversion and 15 degrees inversion. Therefore, the arm of the, the amount of ankle angulation that can be compensated by the hind foot is 30 degrees valgus and 15 degrees varus when the normal subtalar joint is present. Beyond this, a normally mobile forefoot is able to further compensate for the ankle varus and valgus by means of pronation supination. So if you have good functional subtalar joint and forefoot, perhaps you can, the patient, especially in children, they can compensate uh, more deformity of the ankle joint. Also, you have a normal hip, knee, and ankle, subtail, and forefoot joints. There is more possibility to compensate for the ankle and foot deformities. The problem with the long-standing compensated distal tibial angular deformities, they develop contracture of the other joints. And this is a real problem because I've seen that many times. The patient goes to the, or the family take the child to the pediatric orthopedic surgeon with uh, an obvious ankle deformity in the child. And he just tell the patients, we want to do fo more follow up the next year, this four years or five years. But perhaps the surgeon is inviting for trouble because inviting for more contractures of the other joints. So if you have fixed compensatory deformities, perhaps you need to correct all of them or partially of it. That's why we don't advise just leaving the patient with foot and ankle deformity for such a long time, because the patient, when he walks, he compensates for the deformity. Just I want to show you some other deformities in a hurry because I finished my talk. And if you want to correct it by external fixator, you can do it constrained, unconstrained, or semi-constrained with any type of fixators. This is how to correct the forefoot abduction by just displacing the forefoot after fixing the hind foot and midfoot. Gave us you can distract on both sides at the same time, medially and laterally. And supination, you can rotate the forefoot if you want to. And this is an example, simple example. If you have a quino vulgus deformity of the ankle, you see, in this young man and severe arthritic changes, you can do an intraarticular correction. This is the distal tibia. This is the axis of the tibia. And you see again the foot and the equinus deformity of severe varus and severe equinus deformity. You can see here, you can by arthrodesis, you can refashion the distal part and correlate to the varus and the aquinas, and you do cortocotomy to compensate for the shortening. See the correction of the deformity. Again, you can do extra articular correction of the ankle. You have physial injury. See here, severe valgus deformity. This is osteotomy rule number two. The osteotomy is far away from the deformity, which is intraarticular. If this is physial, we don't go, we want to go through, we don't want to go through diaphysis. So we do lengthening, displacement. You see osteotomy rule number two, angulation and displacement. And we get correction. So we can correct intraarticular and extraarticular 
correction. Uh, thank you. Now we can move to the next speaker. Thank you. Gamal, thank you so much. Uh, uh, some questions will come on. I just wanted to uh, quickly ask you this. Uh, frames are not always very comfortable for patients. So some surgeons use part internal, part external fixation. Now, in, 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 in pediatrics, that's probably much harder because of the physis. Uh, the physis are open. In adult, are you, are you a believer in part internal, part external, or completely external fixation for the deformity corrections of foot and ankle? Um, it depends upon the, the type of the deformity. Uh, most of the cases referred to me are severe types of the deformity. So I prefer the gradual treatment because many times, why the gradual treatment to external fixation? Because of the many times after all these years with deformities, I have miscalculation of the deformity. So when I make an, my, the x-ray uh, immediately postoperative, perhaps uh, three days after the operation or something, I found out that my calculations were not right. So I have the ability to correct the deformity after one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month after, gradually after the deformity. And this is the real merit of external fixation, not the external fixation, uh, external fixator itself. The real merit of external fixation is the ability to correct the deformity post-operative, a new clinic, in the outpatient clinic, without anesthesia, without, uh, uh, analgesia even. So if you have a simple deformity and you are sure that you will correct it at the operation, and I'm not the type of surgeon because you know I'm a simple minded and I don't have that experience. I'm not always sure that I'm going to correct the patient fully during the operation. But if you are that confident, why to use an external fixator? You know? I know that many foot and ankle surgeons, they, do, they, they don't use an external fixator because they are very confident, that's it. Okay, thank you. So, we, so we'll go back to the questions towards the end as well, so yeah. Okay. Tom, um, if you could now take it forward for us and we're gonna be looking at your tips and tricks in these very difficult cases with multi-apical deformities and often soft tissue components attached. Thanks, Om. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin and uh, Haven and Gamal for um, getting me into this. Um, and um, I'm going to share some of the tricks I have learned over time. And I learned them from others and I probably uh, started some of my own. So if you recognize this as one of your tricks, uh, and if I haven't um, mentioned your name, please... Um, Bear with me, I don't remember. Okay, so, okay, foot and ankle deformities range from very simple to complex, and they're often associated with other limb trauma. You know, in my practice, I get post-traumatic equine as somebody treated tibia, tibial non-union, and when they start mobilizing, they have a severe equine deformity. And also, you know, pediatric practice of so the whole range. So if you're a foot and ankle surgeon, you get this whole range of deformities, and you need to have uh, understanding of specific disease problems, particularly the paralytic ones, uh, Gamal has already alluded to. And, you know, you just need to make a, a proper assessment because the margin between getting a successful flat uh, foot on the ground and to a very painful, uh, still deformed foot is very narrow in many of these cases. And and I, I believe in both you know, traditional foot and ankle techniques and fixator techniques, and you have to mix and match. I would never say never to any one of those, and we'll see some examples. So I'm going to take you through the whole journey from preoperative assessment to removing the frame and um, emphasize some tips and tricks uh, for um, uh, uh, trainees generally. So, well, you know, it's very important that you spend more time than what you do during surgery. You know, you have to really temper the expectations of both your own ability and that of patients' expectations. And so if I have to give you one tip, and this is it. Um, so yes, have several examples and show them how they're done. And, but again, say that, you know, that's an example, but I cannot always guarantee that. 
and they can meet other patients behind your back because uh, sometimes patients tell things that you haven't told other patients and you know set targets early on so you just say you know this foot will not look normal you won't be able to wear high heels or fashionable shoes but it'll be functional now you're walking on the tip of the foot but i'll make it um so that you can walk on the entire foot so that is very important and then looks are also important you know sometimes you do a good job and they still uh, the foot looks chubby they're not happy so all these expectations you just discuss and particularly if you have a multicultural practice like we have in london uh, respect cultures you know never utter the word amputation with anyone coming from middle east or or far east um, they will either complain or will never come to your clinic again okay so i can't emphasize the importance of thorough examination uh, x rays or any other thing will not uh, is not a, a an alternative uh, you could draw all sorts of angles uh, on the x rays but a thorough clinical examination is more important particularly looking at scars and the source of pain some patients have a very painful neuroma and that's what is causing most of the problem you might end up getting a very good uh, plantigrade foot but the scar is painful and causing trouble and then you know i have a policy of working out which is flexible and which is rigid deformity and the degrees and direction the degree if it is minimal then i would be tempted to do an acute correction and internally fix as hemant was asking about and uh, others i gradually correct and the ones i can't assess i tend to err on correcting gradually like gamal mentioned there are some worrying signs at the very first consultations if you have lots of color changes i've seen patients whose foot color changes throughout that 20 30 minutes consultation um, because either they're emotional whatever that is a warning sign that there is something more going on it's not just simple lack of blood supply they have a fantastic vascularity but you know changing color and pain disproportionate to the condition please keep your knife away don't touch them so here is a patient who started with a normal looking foot a young lady in her teens had a simple incident at school and it started to spiral chronic pain syndrome and the foot deformed like this and it was sent to our clinic to say well can you you know make it look normal um, and at the very first consultation uh, I, i said you know it's not me you should go and see a pain consultant but the patient didn't, didn't understand it i went to a an adult foot and ankle surgeon and uh, needless to say that eventually it ended in amputation because it was so painful um so just be careful don't offer surgery and i have this scheme of segmental assessment you know um i mentally divide foot into three areas a hind foot uh, ankle including talus uh, within the ankle mortis and midfoot four foot deformities don't need frame treatment um, and don't promise that when you do a frame that you'll be able to address toe claw toes etc they have to be either done before or after your frame surgery so each of these segments have a certain pattern of deformation uh, in um, let's say shocker mari tooth the hind foot is inverus and you have cavus and opposite in uh, paralytic disorders like poliomyelitis but it's better to have a such an understanding and here is a scheme of pure equinus i call it pure equinus because everything in the foot is in line in equinus so this is the foot a ischemic um, um, contracture foot an entire segment the whole heel the midfoot and forefoot all are in equinus and you can work out that if you correct the ankle itself the whole foot tripod would come up but as look at this one here this is where the hind foot is neutral and there's four foot equinus so not all equinus are equal so here is the lady who probably had poliomyelitis in her 70s and was getting that frequent bursitis because she was walking on that and here the hind foot is nearly neutral and most deformity in the forefoot and sometimes this concealed test and uh, the next slide is on concealed test so what i do is i just conceal the forefoot like that and then you can see that most of the deformity is in the midfoot to forefoot and the hind foot is neutral so this gives you an idea as to which segments you want to work on um, and it's important uh, again and again to 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 uh, assess that the foot is connected to the leg through talus and it's quite often uh, forgotten uh, particularly when you're all excited about cable varus deformity or plano valgus deformity there might be incidental or 
associated telar instability. And this is particularly important in paralytic disorders, polio, and uh, advanced um, uh, shock arch Murray tooth. So you have to really get out of your office and go and obtain x-rays, supervise x-rays, particularly ankle center. And they should be made to weight bear as much as possible. If you leave it to the radiographer, this will happen. So I'll show you this example. Here is a, a post polio lady with a plano valgus deformity. The entire foot is turning into the flat foot, as you can see here. And uh, it has gone into valgus. And it looks very innocuous. Well, when I just examined her, it didn't add up. The deformity was looking more when she was weight bearing, more than the sum of her uh, you know, three segments, uh, midfoot, uh, hind foot, and tailors. So then I went there and I said, let's have a weight bearing x-ray. And this makes all the difference for this patient. You could do a wonderful triple orthodesis or a, an excellent correction of valgus, but she would be very unhappy and soon that ankle would um, get into trouble. So you, know, you just do this. You have to supervise and first of all, clinically work out each segment and then radiologically confirm that there are no associated deformities. So here is a patient who came in with um, this um, shock at Murray tooth was his primary diagnosis. He's in his 70s and feet were slowly drifting. And then he developed this ulcer on the um, lateral part of the foot. So if you look at it, it looks like a, you know, equinovarus deformity, but it's very difficult to work out where all the components are. So I wanted to look at uh, ankle, the hind foot and the forefoot. So this is again, you have to do Supervised X-rays, I call them in line. In line, that's in the plane of deformity. So here, I made the foot flat on the table or on the plate by rotating the tibia out to the way so that the foot is flat on the ground. Then you can get a clear cut, uh, um, a picture of uh, AP view of the foot. And again, here, you center it on the foot, in line with the foot so that you can get a lateral view. And here is the axial view of the calcaneum. And at the same time, I bring the film here and get an ankle x-ray. So if you look at this here, I can work out that the deformity is not in the ankle, not in the hind foot, because the hind foot looks neutral here. And all the deformity is happening at the tailor navicular and subtalar joint, uh, that complex. So, you know, this you can't work out if you haven't supervised the x-rays. So it's worth spending those 10, 15 minutes. So now we have decided that uh, the patient needs frame treatment because uh, I'm going to mainly talk about frame uh, construction in this talk. So it's better to have a collection of frames and you can see Charlie Taylor and I'm uh, doing more and more Taylor spatial frame and I did Elizabeth, but um, uh, the practice changing so we use this. So I've got a couple of these frames in clinic and I show them and I sit and just look at you know how how I can construct this around the foot. So it is, it helps patient and also focuses to your mind. So here is a lady, uh, I will present this case later on, uh, but 20 year old, 28 year old syndromic patient came here uh, for first time in her life. She wanted her feet uh, corrected because she was getting recurrent cellulitis. So I have this concept of frameable length of the foot. If you see the green line, it tells you the entire sort of soft tissue plus bones length. Whereas when you try to fix this, you only have the, at the most the, the length of red line. And there are techniques of how to just increase this length during surgery. I'll show you later. And there are this concept of hidden deformities. We all um, know that there, there can be compensatory deformities, but I tell patients that there's some deformities come to the fore as they start correcting the deformity. They might not be that obvious. This is particularly important when uh, you know you are doing supramalular correction or correction of forefoot and the you know basically equinus of the foot becomes more obvious as the as the deformity is corrected and the toes may go into into flexion deformities so i used to routinely divide uh, flex attendance but i've seen some patients who are very unhappy and the toe was so floppy so i just don't do it prophylactic anymore i do it um, 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 if they develop and of course think about neurological uh, issues and do a tarsal tunnel release when necessary. So here is a, a osteochondromatosis. Uh, this is a part of the long leg picture, distal tibial valgus, and the foot was drifting into valgus. He didn't have any compensatory 
movement there. Everything was tight at the back to tender Achilles. So I started correcting him. I got him to neutral and then you can see the foot, the hidden deformity of varus and equinus came to light. Unfortunately in this, although I prepared the patient for a, a second procedure to release the tender Achilles and capsule, we worked with physiotherapists and they got better. But it's very important to identify and alert them. And you know, this is very well known in the business that the toes go into flexion. And as I said, I, I tend not to do them prophylactically. Um, and I do them at the time of removal of frame. So interoperative tricks. Um, you know, the common deformity I treat is a, an equinus deformity. And I have learned a couple of things while putting the foot frame. It has to be clutter free so that the patient can weight bear. It's not so much about weight bearing, but it confirms the patient that we have achieved plantar grade foot. And, you know, that, that's much more helpful than any number of x-rays you do. So I don't rely on x-rays that much except worrying about ankle subluxation. Uh, but also when you get the plantar grade foot patient, um, suddenly he says, after all these years, I'm able to feel my heel on the ground. So that also helps. So plan your foot frame or foot plate in, a, in such a way that you clear the plantar surface by at least two finger breadths and tilt the rear end of the frame so that when the, the foot is flat on the ground, it is not touching. I'll show you an example here. So this is how I want the, the, bottom, the rear end should be slightly lifted off and a good clearance. So this is plantar grade foot. The patient can really um, feel good about it once it happens. So I put the frame like that initially and then just lift the back and I ask my assistant to um, you know, shoot a wire so that I can just fix the frame. So the tail up. So I, I always do soft tissue release because I find that it is less painful uh, rather than relying on distraction alone. Um, and I generally use a hex. of the tail calculate uh, the Inman line for a hexapod construction. And since I started uh, using this, I've done half a dozen frames using this technique, the tailor dome stays very well under the tibia and um, I haven't seen any um, adverse effects of doing this. And of course, always overcorrect the deformity once you've reached the plantar grade, uh, overcorrect the deformity, they don't walk after that. And then after four weeks, I remove the frame. So there's another trick when you're doing a difficult calcaneal osteotomy, when everything is other and medially from previous surgery, I put a drill hole, a couple of drill holes at different levels of calcaneum, measure the depth, and I mark my osteotome with a pen, in a marker pen, so that I don't suddenly plunge and go on to the medial side. So that helps, you know, how much to go, because you've measured the depth beforehand. And sometimes the, the frames can get very busy, both in hexapod and in Elizabeth frame, you can't see bone from the metal work. So if there's a critical area which I want to monitor, I put these markers. These are simple KYs, they're left buried in the bone for good, but they can, you know, I can, I can spot them amongst the jungle. Um, so that, that helps and you can try this out. So when you're doing these midfoot osteotomies, it is not as simple as drawing lines on x-ray. They are in a different plane and it's better to feel your way with two K wires. I just say, create a K wire corridor. It's a well-known technique. I use the osteotome um, and, and just follow a parallel to it. Um, and also you can use uh, this for Geely saw. You can follow a K wire. And then I make sure that I open the osteotomy to make sure that it's all running okay. And then I use these stirrup wires while you're there. You can use two olive wires and fix them to the ring so that they give you a good uh, grip on the um, um, osteotomy. Okay, well, always anticipate swelling. And how do you do that? I just do all my um, soft tissue and bony surgery without tunicate. I release the tunicate, put pressure bandage. And that gives me an idea as to how swollen that the foot is likely to be. I put two bulky swabs and put it. And then when I put the, my frame, I make sure that there's two finger breaths, not only from the frame ring, but also from the straps. So post-operative swelling is not, you know, won't be impinging on the straps. 
And sometimes the rings conflict, um, like here, you know, I didn't anticipate as I was coming up, I couldn't go any further. And since then, I just do this. Um, I use a U ring or a, a you know, foot ring here and keep this open like Tower of, Tower of London Bridge. And then you can keep going as much as you, as you want without compromising the stability. So, well, you know, internal fixation, Hemant asked this, you know, I always err on hind foot. If this is a, a, a small deformity in the hind foot like whereas I'm happy to correct through a calcaneal osteotomy and fix it. But I certainly, to reduce the frame duration, I consider internal fixation at the time of removal of frame and um, you know, particularly creating lateral and medial columns. I will show the case and case discussion. And this certainly reduces the frame duration and also maintains the deformity. And at the very beginning um, of, of this, you know, either you can create a marker on the osteotomy, but it is rare um, to be able to confidently see the osteotomy and see whether it's healing or not. I just look at the shape of the foot, Generally, midfoot osteotomy is healed between six to 18 weeks. And if I'm really concerned about it, particularly in diabetic feet, I get a CT scan. Otherwise, I just look at the shape, duration of time, and then I remove the frame and protect the foot, either with internal fixation or a brace. So take home messages are uh, careful pre-op consultation and assessment is important. Uh, it's important to spend as much time um, with the patient as you would do, uh, doing a very meticulous and complex surgery and talk about a whole range of things that you might come across some hidden deformities which might need surgery or which might respond to physio. And more importantly, just say that sometimes, particularly in paralytic deformities, you will need a sprint forever. Uh, and they're a bit surprised that after all this treatment, they have to still have to have an AFO because there's no muscle power. And of course, um, Reduce the operating time, swelling is an important thing. So do your soft tissue and bony surgery. The frame can be done without uh, tube decay. And um, yeah, make anticipate hardware, con hardware conflict and don't rely on x-rays always. They're not always helpful. And consider internal fixation at the time of frame removal. Um, that's it for me, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, John. It was yeah. Uh, very insightful. It clearly shows uh, you have a lot of experience and have done uh, lots of the times. And I think that's the uh, always the case when you do more, you're going to do more trouble and you learn more. And I think you can all, always give tips and tricks to uh, uh, other people. So, uh, and do you have any different approach between the a pediatric and, and adult cases, because in adult, often you'll find, particularly in your practice, patients have a lot of previous surgeries as well. So is there any approach different, any different way you approach pediatric and adults? Yes, um, I think first of all, um, with, um, with Ponsetti, success at Ponsetti, I'm doing less and less pediatric frames. And if I have to do, as uh, Gamal Hosni said, we would rely on um, uh, gradual correction and because these bones are generally soft and not big enough to do an osteotomy and put a screw. Occasionally I've done that in spina bifida uh, and uh, you might as well be putting the screw in the sand rather than in the bone. So, you know, um, they're very soft. Yes, um, you know, pediatric practice is different and um, um, yeah, I, will, I will add more on frame um, uh, than, than um, the techniques I've just shown you. Now, this is probably the out of the uh, remit of uh, this sort of uh, webinar, but just a quick uh, thing if you have any experience. So in, in diabetic feet, and uh, we tend to use more wires and people come into uh, a lot more trouble with broken wires and um, uh, slow healing and infections. Do, do, do you have any special tips and tricks for these diabetic shako feet? Yeah, no, diabetic feet are, are a challenge. Uh, and um, I use extra wires. If there's three and I use you four, expecting that one of them would break, number one. Number two, frequent follow-up. You know, this is expensive treatment, but um, you have to bring them back very frequently because most of them don't, their foot is not attached to their brain. The homunculus has no foot reflection. 
you know, I see these patients walking, breaking even the ring, you know, let alone the wire. So, you know, you can't blame them. So if you start the frame treatment, you just sit on them tight. They come regularly and I give them all the support. And, and the interesting is this uh, wire infection. I haven't seen that many wire infections. When I first started, I had all the problems, which, you know, literature is full of them with, you know, repeated breaks. But with, um, you know, developing, oh, putting extra pins, reserve pins, I call them, instead of three points of fixation, the four foot, I would add a fourth one. Uh, it makes the frame busy and quite tricky, but all you need to do is if the wire is broken, you can take that wire out and not worry about the, the, the frame um, stability. I think in diabetic foot, knowing that you can get into trouble is half the ward one. You know, there are different beasts, so if you're prepared for that, you will keep a tight eye on them. And then again, remove the frame early and maybe use an internal fixation or a brace. And, uh, you know, in diabetic, again, you don't wait for the bony fusion all the time. There's good evidence that a sound fibrous fusion is good enough to keep the feet stable. But that's a different argument. Altogether. Now, there's a question from Alex Cherkashin, and he's asking if, uh, what is, um, what's your opinion about uh, transfixing the toes during the foot deformity correction to avoid clawing of the toes? Now that, that, that's, that's a great question, and uh, I have moved away from it simply because, you know, these wires very difficult to get in bone. They sometimes end up in soft tissues, they're long, and they're causing more grief than any good. And I had patients whose toes were so hyperextended at the end of the treatment, there was no flexor left. You know, that that's, can be unpleasant. So I, I tell them that either we can do this or you wait, you know, some of them while waiting, while the treatment is going on, physiotherapy is stretching and we have used loops and um, we got away at least 50% of the times without doing flexor tenotomy. Nice. So, yeah, I'm not proactive. I've gone away from proactive to, to as and when needed, maybe I'll come back for circle and um, I'll start doing it. But I think I'm a bit more happier not being aggressive with, uh, you know, taking your knife to, to flex uh, tendons. You know, there might be another approach that you don't uh, do flex tendons, fix them straight with k wires. Probably that's an option. Uh, I haven't tried that. I mean, I'm sure uh, Alex is asking about why not just fix them in straight, anticipating that they will go into flexion without doing flex anatomy. If that is the question, then I don't have any experience with that. Right. I think we'll have to move to cases, Gavin. Uh Yes, um, I think we'll try and we'll come back to some questions afterwards if we have some time, um, because there are some number of uh, ideas that we'd like to discuss. But let's go on to um, some cases. Um, Gamal, perhaps you'd like to start with a case? Yes. It's back to the uh, him question about uh, diabetic feet. This is 60 years old female with uncontrolled diabetes. She had a mild trauma two years ago. She's overweight. And she had almost uh, dislocated. It's dislocated ankle, as you see here. Charcot dislocated ankle, the foot is dislocated posteriorly, this is the anterior part, total dislocation of the foot, and again the foot is dislocated laterally, so it's total dislocation of the foot, and you see the skin, questionable vascularity, as you see here, And she has a foot ulcer, resistant foot ulcer, which had been treated by the bridegroom many times before. And she uses the color of the foot. You know, I'm asked to uh, watch the color of the foot before the operation. You see this cyanotic foot. Many people, I don't know, from the general surgeons, they think that uh, if you have a charcot foot or charcot uh, ankle, uh, that means most probably you have a, a vascular problem. 
In my experience, which is very limited, this is not true. Almost always there is no problem with the vascularity. It's just peripheral problems, but vasculature is okay. So in such a patient, again, remember that we do the mid diaphyseal angle and the joint orientation line. And we wanted this line to pass through the center of ro rotation of the, of the talus. We are planning to do an arthrodesis and to correct the foot. The patient was planned for uh, amputation. And they just sent to me just to, to have a look before amputation. And this is the center of rotation, as you see here, at the lateral. And this is the foot. This is, you see, the foot. And this is the mid diaphyseal axis of the tibia. Remember that this line has to rotate something like 130 degrees to be 90 degrees to this line. So we have rotated 130 degrees. We thought about acute or gradual treatment. If you do an acute treatment for such a patient, it's okay, I think you, we can correct it, but you have to do much shortening. And at the same time, you have to rotate the foot 130 degrees and you have to stretch the neurovascular bundle such a long distance. And the patient now for two years, two years have this problem and this location. And she's not, she's not good bearing now for about uh, nine months. So if you do acute treatment, it's possible, it's possible, but it's there's a difficulty or there is a, the risk of jeopardizing the neurovascular bundle. But what about the gradual treatment? The problem again with the gradual treatment, if we correct this deformity, perhaps it will take two and a half months to correct the deformity, one millimeter per day or something. And again, I have to come back to your discussion before this case about the rate of pentrach infection. Of course, we have a very high rate of pentrach infection. And again, we have breakage of the wires. We have all these problems and you have to face if the patient stays in the frame for nine months or eight months or something. So it's very difficult to do gradual treatment to correct the deformity. And again, it's very difficult to get to do an acute treatment. So. I usually do this uh, exercise. We do acute and gradual treatment. So we correct the deformity partially. Then we continue after the operation to correct that. And again, this is the real merit of the external fixation, that you can reduce the fracture. You can correct the deformity after the operation, not during the operation. So with arthrodesis again, as you see here, we did minimal resection and we corrected the equinus deformity partially. This is, we corrected perhaps about 60% of the deformity and we left the hinges at the site of the core or the site of the osteotomy. Why we put many wires? This, we usually do this in cases of charco joint <clears throat> because we wanna be sure, especially in the AP that it's not displaced because in many times you have very osteoporotic bone and you cannot find exactly which part of the tibia or of the um, talus left to be sure that you are in the right position. So we correct, this is acute treatment that we corrected the foot before the operation. And we put the frame, as you see here, in an equinus deformity. <clears throat> you see here, we have three levels of fixations and two hydroxyapatite coated half pins. And each level we have three wires, not two wires. So it's almost double the normal fixation because we have the problems of uh, pin trike infection, breakage of the wire and the early loosening of the wires. I remember that this patient did not walk now for nine months and she has severe osteoporosis. And we started giving her 
teriparatide immediately because she has severe osteoporosis. So because of these three reasons, we almost put double the wires, as you see here. See the number of wires in the calcaneus and number of wires here. You see how many wires? <clears throat> three wires in the forefoot. Not one wire, three wires. Again, this is the acute correction part and we put wires. Sometimes th people think that if you put wires, <clears throat> you will prevent uh, further correction, but this is not true because we use uh, two millimeter wires and they bend the let when you do the gradual correction with no harm. So this is now after immediate postoperative. This is the foot and this is, so we still have maybe 60 degrees more of equinus. Now we do gradual correction using the hinges. Gradual correction. See the gradual correction that we have. Of course, we removed part of the fibula because this is transfibular. And you see the gradual correction of the wires, of the, uh, of the foot. Again, we checked with the AP and lateral to be sure that we are on the right track. And this is at the end of the correction. Again, because of the problem of loosening, we used many, the patient is huge. She's really fat. So you see the links here. It's not, it's not two hinges and distract or something. You see how many links we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perhaps there's another one, an eighth one on the other side. And you have three levels of fixation. And you have three wires, each level. Two hydroxyapatite coated afters. And this is after removal. You see it's about 90 degrees. Good. And this is an X-ray picture during removal. Usually we remove the, uh, the frame. And after we remove the frame, because we had complete union, we put the patient in a cast. Because if the patient stays without weight bearing for eight months and you try to convince her to walk in the frame, she will walk, but she can hardly do this. So her day, she can walk for one minute or two minutes. So don't rely on weight bearing during treatment. So we want a, we want a patient to do full weight bearing and we leave these wires just to be sure that there is no problem. You see here, this is before and during gradual treatment, and this is after, and we leave the wires. When we leave the wires, just to remind you, put the position now. When we remove, we don't remove the wires, we put a cast, and I will show you how we put the cast. This is the cast we use. We, do, we, leave, the, the, we leave the wires, and we put high heels and high forefoot, about three centimeters. So when the patient walks, she does not do it bearing on the wires, just on the forefoot and the hind foot. This is the end of it, because this is the end of the exercise. But after that, we remove the, we change the, the cast, another, another cast for one and a half months, and we leave the wires and we remove them. We think that uh, removal of the wires again will stimulate the bone healing in cases of uh, sharp joint. And this is the end of this simple case. Yes, okay. Great case, uh, Gamal. Thanks very much. I mean, a uh, lot uh, you've said there. Um, I wonder if we can just discuss, can we go into the next case, um, Om? Or would, uh, yeah. No, whatever. If you have time, I can I can present. I can just quickly go through that. Or if you, if just, you think, yeah, um, just maybe for shorten it, it'll be, I think you've got a good case to go through, and I think it'd be nice to see another case. So if you could just quickly present, that'd be great. Okay, so here we are. This is a case of a uh, 20, 28 year old in India. Um, uh, upper syndrome, um, subluxing hip, bilateral CTEV. She never had any treatment uh, for cultural reasons. But the problem um, she started facing was 
that she was getting admitted to hospital for recurrent cellulitis because she would walk on the outer border and just wanted to fit, uh, corrections. Um, so here is her um, 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 picture, you know, completely uh, deformed uh, cable virus uh, uh, feet and uh, syndactyly. And these are the sort of areas where she was developing cellulitis. And they were all stiff deformities, um, very little give. Um, in um, uh, any of the areas, both you know, hind foot, mid foot, and um, um, fore foot. So what she does is she's high BMI, and she has an attendant to help with actors of daily living. Uh, she's able to do, but she's not keen to do. So uh, my consultation was to say, okay, we can get you, um, you know, feet flat on the ground. They might not look very pretty, um, but. Uh, at least you should not have these recurrent cellulitis. You'll have to wear custom-made shoes because the foot will look broad and in a sort of square shape. Uh, wouldn't have the usual sort of arches, etc. And uh, midfoot and hind foot would usually be stiff. Um, and I also discuss the complications um, of uh, all the pin site infections and under over correction and all that. Okay, so this is the x-ray, um, you know, I had to go and do this x-ray in line. So if you let them do the x-rays they want as while standing and they're just not in line, but as soon as you do the, the foot focus line, you can see the entire um, sort of um, skeleton. Um, so my surgical plan was to do some soft tissue release at the ankle, do a tendon Achilles lengthening, and also in the rear, uh, hind foot, I wanted to do, you know, as a correction through subtalar joint. I was expecting neurological problems in view of severe deformity, so added a tarsal tunnel release. And the working length of this foot was very short, as I um, uh, showed you in the tips and tricks talk. And I'll show you how I get around it. And I was going to use a uh, back frame, gradual correction of forefoot, acute correction of hind foot, and I was going to consider um, um, internal fixation at the end of full correction of the foot. So this is my tarsal tunnel release, and at the same time, I just sectioned the incision towards the back and tendoic heel is lengthening and capsulotomy. And this is my lateral approach, so I corrected, uh, um, you know, you can see the height of the calcaneum, I brought it out and then held it with uh, K wires, and then I replaced it with uh, um, screws, and then I did an osteotomy in the midfoot. Um, and then this is um, the, the problem of working length, uh, because you know your, your fixation would be here, and another one here, and you will really struggle to put any short, even the short, extra short stretch. Even in Elizabeth days, you know, it is, it is a struggle for parents or a carer to get into that space and turn the screws. So what I do is take the slack up. So let me just run this. So I did posterior release. I've done the midfoot osteotomy. Two nickel is off. And I take the slack up when I'm fitting the fixations and putting the frame. So I'll just show you this little bit of animation. Yeah, that is by taking the slack up after doing a bit of midfoot osteotomy, as Kamal said. You know, he reduced, partially reduced the equinus, I partially reduced the, the forefoot adduction and uh, ankle to get space for my uh, struts. And this is my butt construction. So this is a, a double ring because she's a heavy girl and I knew I need a lot of force. So I started putting this uh, vertical ring here and my um, struts were really, you know, so the ring is pushed forward and I would have struggled to get the, uh, get the forefoot fixation. So I then moved it backwards. And as you can see, I went very back. So I could, I could just about get my forefoot um, fixation and hind foot wires in here. And then that was my acute correction. And then I started uh, correcting it. So this is my um, supination of the forefoot. And there's also a bit of cavus. I calculated the mounting parameters and gradually corrected it. I think TSF or any hexapod is the greatest kit for doing this sort of more accurately, derotating the foot. And this is the end result. I, I just cut down some slides. Um, but so this is, you know, sort of a plantigrade foot. We haven't lost too much of length in that foot. If anything, we gained, I would say, a centimeter um, here and there, and particularly in the midfoot uh, osteotomy. And at the time, uh, fortunately for me, the, the toes are uh, have syndactyly, so I didn't have to deal with uh, curly toes. And um, 
I, at the time of removal of frame, I put a medial column plate uh, and just left it. And then at the end of it, I made her a sort of um, uh, encasing boot. You know, it's not possible to wear trainers um, this early. This is, you know, within four weeks of post-operative period. Uh, but gradually, we made her some uh, uh, boots which are custom made or roomy sort of Wellington type boots um, to get on with it. And this is four years down the line. Uh, she's holding well. Not that she does much, but at least she's not getting admitted to hospital for recurrent term cellulitis. Thank you very much. And I'll just um, stop there. Excellent. Well, that's, that's great. Um, thank you, Om and uh, Gamal, for wonderful talks. Um, a huge amount of information. Um, so, you know, guys, please, when you when this does go onto YouTube, go back and look at it again and go through these talks uh, because it's a wealth of information and experience there that certainly will very much help you when you then come to analyze uh, and to manage these complex foot deformities. So, so great case. And I think, thank you, everybody, uh, and Heyman for obviously the health deformity course and uh, organizing all these webinars. I hope to see you again at the next webinar, um, which will be on the 28th of November again from the whole deformity course and we'll be looking at fixator assisted deformity correction which is very topical and i think will also be very useful to those that wish to join so thank you very much and hope you have a great thank morning you. evening or a great day and look forward to seeing you again goodbye thank you Gavin. thank you Gamal. thank you Gamal. Thank, thank you everybody and all the participants thank you Alan. if you're still there see you soon in london thank okay. you <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs>